Oh, hey there. I was just checking my social media. Can't notice humans are pretty social creatures, but that's actually not unique to us. Let's talk about some of the social behavior we see in the rest of the primates. Primates are very social creatures, and within this group, we find so many different complicated social interactions. Let's talk about a few of them. Just a reminder, we recently talked about a lot of different primate diets. If you look at all primates, there's a lot of different things they eat. The two most common are fruits and leaves. And remember, diet really affects everything. It affects group size, social dynamics and organization, ranging patterns, body size, activity patterns, gut and teeth morphology, locomotion, life history, brain size, and really everything about an organism. So we're going to talk a little bit about how food influences a few things relating to social behavior. For this lecture, we have a couple goals. We're going to first talk about why primates even live in groups in the first place. We'll talk about a social organization. Then we'll go into mating systems. And lastly, we'll talk about the socio-ecological model and bring it in diet and how that affects our social organization. So first, why do primates live in groups anyway? If you've met an introvert lately, you know they hate people. There are a lot of cons to living in groups. There are limited resources. You need absolutely more resources to feed everyone in a large group. You see here we have a squirrel monkey and a lemur fighting over a piece of fruit. If you remember anything about these primates, they don't live anywhere near each other. So this is probably from a zoo. And now if you're living in a group, you have increased competition over those limited resources. And you're gonna need a larger territory for food, water, nests. You're now more conspicuous to predators when you're in a big group. You're also at risk for aggressive social interactions. Here you can see two silverback gorillas going at it and two snub-nosed monkeys who don't look too friendly. So what are even the benefits to living in a group? Before we go on, can you answer this question on your own? Hopefully you came up with a few answers, but let's talk about some of the benefits to living in a group. First, predator defense. <laughs> these aren't primates, these are meerkats, but these show a really good example of increased vigilance. Meerkats are really good at being alert and looking for predators. And everyone in the group does this, so you have more eyes and you're more likely to spot that predator. Same thing for primate groups. The more individuals you have in a group, the more likely you are to spot a predator before it kills anyone. You can also have cooperative defense. You can mob a predator. Again, this is a meerkat example, but now we have a bunch of meerkats surrounding a snake. So all of them can mob and attack the snake, so it's less likely to eat any individual in this group. We also see alarm calls. Here we have a prairie dog, but we also have a primate example. These are vervets. Vervets live in a couple different places in Africa, and they have um, several different alarm calls. They have distinct alarm calls for eagles, leopards, and snakes. And what's really cool is they're distinct and you can see they have different behavioral reactions. If there's an eagle, all of them run down the tree because you don't want to be caught in the tree. If there's a snake, they run up the tree. If there's a leopard, they all look because leopards are stalking predators and pretty much when they know that they've been spotted, they give up. And this is a really cool example because they have different alarm calls that elicit distinct different behavior. We also just see that there's a dilution effect to predator defense. Because there's just more individuals, we can sometimes call this the selfish herd, it's just less likely that you're going to be the one caught by the predator. If you have this many penguins all together, well, the predator can't eat all of them. And this is one of the reasons why we see just lots and lots of herbivores gather together. Here we have wildebeest in Africa. This is also related to predator confusion. If you were all running um, at really fast speeds, yeah, your predator is going to be a little taken aback and it's going to be harder for that predator to pick out one single individual to eat. You can also increase your foraging efficiency depending on what type of food you eat. 
If your food is patchy, when you're all moving together in a group, it's easier for everyone to find that food at the same time. And especially if you have to travel between different places, it would be pretty bad if you just visited a tree that another, another primate just ate all the fr fruit off of. So everybody moving together will go to the same trees and you hopefully won't encounter something that's just been eaten. You, we also find foraging efficiency, especially in regards to hunting. Chimpanzees do occasionally do cooperative hunting and hunt this poor guy here, the red colobus. There are also benefits to, for social interactions. You have access to mates. They're right there in your group. You do not need to go find them. You also have assistance in child rearing. We see a lot of co-parenting in primates. There are also increased learning opportunities in primates with social groups. There are some that we do see learned uh, tool use. Um, we also have the opportunity for information sharing. Um, and we see a lot of different cooperation and coalitions between different primates. Here we have a parent um, raising their little chimpanzee here. And here we have two young capuchins learning from an older capuchin how to eat this fruit. Of course, there are many costs to social interactions. There is increased risk of disease. We know that a little bit too well right now. There are risk of social conflicts. Now you have competition for mates, even though you don't need to find them. One of the darkest costs of living in a group is infanticide. Infanticide is the killing of an infant. Um, this is the actually the highest cause of infant mortality in mounted gorillas. Um, here we have a baboon um, um, killing an infant. Um, this is actually observed in 17 different primate species and 12 genera. Um, infanticide is an interesting thing, and, um, and we actually think in several cases it is an evolutionary strategy for males because if they uh, kill an infant that is not their child, the mother of that child will be more likely to uh, give birth to their child sooner. Um, this is only due to something called lactational amenorrhea. When you are a breastfeeding female, you actually cannot get pregnant. Breastfeeding and being pregnant are both incredibly metabolically intensive. You do not want to do both at the time. At the same time, you literally cannot eat enough food to support three. It's already hard enough to support two when you're pregnant. So that's why all mammals have this thing. So infanticide is a strategy for males to stop lactational amenorrhea in females so they can have their child sooner. Yeah, it's ugly. It's dark. Evolution is not pretty. And sometimes we do see strategies like these. And considering we see it fairly regularly in primates, it's probably a real thing. But let's talk about group size and different goals and why we might see a larger or smaller group. All primate groups, they wanna maximize access to critical resources, but they also wanna minimize within group competition. You want to maximize success in between group conflicts. There might be different populations of the same species which are competing for the exact same resources. And you want to minimize predation risk. You also want to maximize reproductive success. And really what we see, group size is all about food. And there are different trends we see based on what different primates eat. So let's look at a couple of trends here. In larger groups, they are primarily terrestrial. They live on the ground. They are diurnal. They are active during the day. They are frugivorous. They primarily eat fruit. And they have a high predator density. A high predator density tends to um, encourage primates to form larger groups to protect against predators. In smaller groups, we see a different type of trend. They are primarily arboreal, or they live in the trees. They are more nocturnal, active at night. They tend to be more folivorous or eat leaves, and they also tend to have a low predator density. When there are fewer predators, there isn't that pressure to form a large group, so primates will tend to be in smaller groups to reduce food competition. In some primates, we do see something called territoriality, and this is when you defend a specific home area from other populations in the same species. It's really costly. You have to take the time to patrol your um, habitat 
and there is the potential for in, um, injury. We only see this when we have patchily distributed resources that you are able to defend from another group of your species. We see territoriality in chimps, and there have been several um, examples where we've seen chimps actually go to war and annex the territory of another primate group, as you can see in this map here. On the figures below, you can see two different examples. A is a territorial species. All of these home ranges do not overlap at all. On B, that is not a territorial species. When a species isn't territorial, you might see their home ranges overlap. So why do primates live in groups? And what are the consequences of group living?